Good morning again and welcome to the Cross Star Museum at FIU. Thank you for being here um, for our conference today and also we hope that you stay uh, for the reception of the evening in honor of Dr. Juan Martinez. Uh, my name is Juan Luani, director of the Cuban Research Institute, which organized today's events. Before I proceed, I'd like to acknowledge the council sponsorship of several partners uh, within FIU and other institutions. First, the Kimberly Green, that American and Caribbean Center. Secondly, the Frost Star Museum. Also, the Miami Dade County Public Schools and Cerdula Arte will be sponsoring today and tomorrow's lecture in the evening. In addition, I want to recognize the generous support of Dar uh, Darlene and Jorge de Perez, which made uh, this particular conference and also the collection. And you can see some of the works of art uh, uh, on display. Uh, we're happy to dedicate uh, today's event, as I said before, to FIU professor emeritus of art history, Dr. Juan Martinez, who hopefully will be here at some point during the day, in recognition of his lasting <coughs> contributions to teaching, researching, and exhibiting Cuban and Cuban American art. Dr. Martinez's seminal work has served as an inspiration for many art critics and others interested in modern Cuban culture. Now, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. John Stack, the founding dean of the Stephen Green School of International Public Affairs, and we'll give his welcome to you. Thanks, Jorge. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I saw in the potential of Cuban studies uh, a great future. It had been part of our Latin Ameri a wonderful Latin American and Caribbean studies program, but as I was building the School of International and Public Affairs, uh, I decided to uh, separate. And uh, the collaboration between LAC and CRI uh, has been extraordinary. And this gathering is an expression of that. So it's really a great honor to help open this two-day conference on Cuban and Cuban-American art. Uh, Cuban and Cuban-American art is a rich blend of cultural influences re reflecting really the diverse demographics of an island nation that has had a global impact. The story of Cuban art is a story of the Cuban people, their history, their culture, their identity, both nationally and throughout the diaspora and beyond. And so to examine some of the defining moments of Cubers, Cubers yes, I'm from Massachusetts, <laughs> Cubers' artistic evolution, we have gathered some of the top scholars, curators, and collectors in the field. And I have to tell you, my mother's favorite cousin ended up in Venice and Oriente. So we have letters from Cuba uh, from the 1950s, uh, right as the uh, revolution was beginning. Uh, so to illustrate these defining moments, we will reflect upon some of the best known masters of Cuban art through uh, Jorge and Darlene's wonderful gift to the Green School and the Frost Art Museum. I'm so grateful to the Perezes. Uh, Jorge told me in an email that he really wished he could be here. Uh, in many ways, that was the easiest and most flawless gift the Green School has ever received. He had met with uh, scholars uh, and representatives at the University of Miami where he's a member of the board. And then he came over to visit us. And he said that uh, he, had, he had great admiration for public universities. Uh, he had been at, he, he studied at uh, Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan. And so we talked about the mission of FIU and uh, I was invited with Carol Damien uh, to their house, and we went through the collection, and it was an incredible experience. So let me express personally my gratitude to the Perez family 
and their support of the Green School and certainly of, F of CRI. I also want to add a word uh, to Jorge's lovely dedication to Juan Martinez. Juan had been my colleague for a long, long time here. Uh, I love the man. Uh, I admire his work, uh, his book on Cuban uh, art uh, is, a, is really a classic and uh, I'm sorry that Juan is not with us at this moment. He's made a lasting uh, impression inspiring students, scholars, and art critics uh, to better appreciate Cuban art. And uh, last but not least, I want to thank Lisa. Lisa, stand up. Lisa Picard is here from the Kimberly Green uh, Latin American and Caribbean Center. Lisa, thank you for all the work that you do thank to support you. She deserves it. She deserves that good applause. Uh, I want to thank the producers. The Philip and Patricia Frost Museum here as our hosts, and really particularly our partners in the Dade County Public Schools. That is what Jorge Perez wanted. He didn't want this to be a static collection. He wanted it brought into the community, and we're doing it through the wonderful teachers uh, from Miami Dade. So thank you for all of your support and participation in this uh, incredible event. Uh, really, my friend, the director of CRI, needs no introduction, but he's going to get one, whether he likes it uh, or not. Uh, Jorge brings to uh, FRI an incredible resume uh, in anthropology, where he is a professor in our Department of Global and Sociocultural Studies. No one has studied the diaspora in all its complexity more than Jorge Perez. The volume that will likely come out of this conference will be an example of that. So Jorge, I'm so proud to work with you, and I'm honored to be here. Everyone, Jorge Juan. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Dr. Stack, and thank you for confusing me with Jorge Perez. <laughs> I would like now to ask Claudio Rodriguez, curator of the Frost Art Museum, to come to the podium. I welcome you as well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, George said, I'm Claudia Rodriguez, I'm the curator here at the Frost Art Museum, and on behalf of Dr. Pomeroy, who couldn't be with us unfortunately, she's in LA participating in the leadership program, the Getting Leadership Program. And the rest of the staff, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, the Frost Art Museum and the presentation of the Movable Nation. Um, also, I'd like to repeat some of the thank yous that you said. Uh, thank you to George and Darlene Perez uh, for their generous gift, which allows us to host uh, these mini meaningful education programs such as this one. I also want to thank you as well, George, and the whole entire crew at CRI for, uh, for this important event. Kimberly Green um, Latin America and Caribbean Center, which is my, uh, one of my school, uh, my old school, uh, the Miami Dade Public County Schools, and all these team participants for the, the patent panelists that will be here today. I also want to extend a personal thank you, even though he's not here, to uh, Juan Martinez as well for his years of, uh, he was an old professor of mine as well. I think a lot of us went through Juan here. The years of guidance and mentorship and friendship, uh, very much appreciated. Um, well, the basic goal of this conference is to delve into some of the defining moments of our Cuban artistic evolution from this multiple disciplinary perspective. Really, it's, it's a lot more. The gift by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Perez, including 24 works of art, some which you can see here, which span different periods, times, media, artists. You, you have some works by Delanda Lucy here, by Mesa, by Romanac, Romanac, I'm sorry, Carlos Enriquez, and they span from turn of the 20th century all the way to about mid, mid 50s. Um, it represents an exceptional opportunity to help uh, develop the FIU into a permanent leader in the study, uh, permanent leader in the study and scholarship of Cuban issues. Uh, it also helps us to foment collaboration across disciplines here in the university and departments and cultural institutions as well, and in the, in the community at large. Uh, the outcome, I think, of these collaborations is going to be proved to be substantial and uh, extremely exciting for for us all here involved. And also, I get to. I get to play with these works of art, and I'm going to include some of these in the permanent collection exhibition, which I'll, uh, I'll get to a little bit later. 
Uh, also, um, before I go, I'd like to sort of introduce, uh, tell you about our, little sum our summer and fall schedule, which is going to be Latin American heavy, as well to invite you to come and see some of our openings. First, uh, July 8th, coming up a uh, couple of weeks, we're presenting the work of Manuel Carrillo, which is a Mexican photographer. It's a little uh, suite of 32 works, I believe, we have that came in from our permanent collection. And uh, it's dealing with issues of Mexicanidad and mid-century photography. And then across in the Grand Gallery is uh, featuring Possible Worlds, uh, which it's contemporary Mexican photography. It's nine uh, Mexican artists dealing with fantasy and fiction, so it's a nice counterbalance from the traditional Mexican photography to the contemporary Mexican photography. In the uh, fall, we're going to reinstall our permanent collection, which hasn't been done in about eight years, nine years. So we'll be reinstalling our permanent collection. In this permanent collection, we will include some of the, 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 the Perez gifts, including some of the works. We also have some other works by uh, Kun Bermudez and so on. And uh, in the fall, uh, it's an exciting schedule because we're turning it again, completely over to Latin America. I'm working with the um, OAS Museum, the AM Museum in Washington, D.C., and we're looking at, um, at their collection of uh, abstract <coughs> and expressionist works across the continent. Uh, and it's going to span about six decades in about 20 different countries. And then in uh, November 4th, Mary, November 4th, we're opening a Rafael Soriano Artists in this day. And it's a major retrospective of Rafael Soriano and all his works. So I'd like to welcome you again November 4th, <coughs> September 9th, and July 8th. And I'll have you around if you want any more information regarding any of the exhibitions here. So once again, I would like to welcome you to the Frost. No, we don't have an aquarium or a planetarium. <laughs> Art Museum. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you for the support that you always uh, give us to the uh, Cuban Research Institute. Let me just say a few words about the program and then we'll turn it over to the first panel so that we can keep up with the schedule. Um, the title of, a, of the event, as you can see in the program, is uh, it refers to Cuba as a movable nation. And that phrase that we actually uh, borrowed from uh, my colleague, uh, a Cuban American literary and art critic, you see somewhere in the audience, uh, Andrea Valle Herrera, uh, who writes in her 2011 book, uh, Cuban Artists Across the Diaspora. And I quote, just as Cuba and its people have absorbed and been transformed by diverse presences and cultural elements, it has also become a movable nation, a traveling, prismatic site of rupture and continuity resulting from continuous out-migrations and scatterings. So we take this very interesting phrase that uh, Andrea has, has coined to talk about the various ways in which uh, several generations of Cuban writers and artists as well as other intellectuals on the island and in the diaspora have drawn the contours of their movable nation according to different historical perspectives, different geographic locations, and different political ideologies. And as has already been said, the basic purpose of this gathering today is to look at some of these uh, examples, some of these moments, to understand how Cuban and Cuban American art has served to build a sense of national and also transnational identity. The uh, conference uh, really has assembled some of the leading scholars nationally and transnationally uh, in various countries and various locations within the U.S. We have a strong delegation from New York for some reason, but also other places within uh, the U.S. and also Coral Gables. Uh, so uh, it, I think it's a very uh, representative sample of uh, current thinking and writing and researching about um, this very complex topic that is Cuban art and Cuban American art. By studying the main periods in the development of Cuban art, I reflected partly in the various art collections that you're going to be able to see some of that uh, here. Conference participants will attempt to identify both the constant as well as the changing elements and symbols in the portrayal of Cubania or Cubanidad, uh, which can loosely be translated as Cuban art. We've also invited, as we've already told you, K-12 uh, teachers of the Miami-Dade County Public Schools to attend the conference today, and then tomorrow they will have their own session, a hands-on workshop, to discuss some of the classroom applications and uh, the material presented in the conference today. So again, I'll be working hard today and tomorrow. We thank Lina Machado, who's also somewhere in the audience, for taking on the coordination of this part of the program. Finally, I wanted to say that we plan to publish the uh, conference presentations, including illustrations from the various art collection here at FIU, to include, increase public awareness uh, and access to the valuable resources, not only here at the Frost, but elsewhere at FIU. I'll be personally in charge of compiling, reviewing, and editing a volume to be submitted for publication uh, to University Press, so I'll be pestering some of the conference participants so they can turn in their papers uh, in time. 
So without further ado, uh, let me ask the members of the first panel, especially Lisa Picard, who will uh, chair this panel, to come to the panel uh, in front, and, and we'll be able to start in a minute. Thank you all for being here. Director of the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center, and I would like to thank all of you for coming out. It's a, a pleasure to participate, Jorge. Thank you for putting it together. And I also thank the CRI staff for all of their hard work, as well as the support of SIPA and the Frost Art Museum. Um, I also want to give a special welcome to our colleagues at Miami Dade County Public Schools, Alina Rodriguez and Mabel Morales, for all of their wonderful work and their continued partnership. Uh, we really couldn't do what we do without their support, so thank you to both of you. So to get started with the program, the first panel we're going to be looking at the origins of Cuban art in the Spanish colonial period. I want to welcome my fellow panelists. I look forward to a really wonderful panel and an engaging Q&A afterwards. Um, we're going to give each panelist about 20 minutes for their presentation, and then we'll open up the floor for q and I'm going to be strict with my time, like a good German girl, so <laughs> please, please, um, please adhere to that. Um, our first presenter is Emilio Cueto. Emilio Cueto is a Cuban-American attorney and collector who specializes in Cuba's colonial graphic art and music. He is the author of several books and catalogs, in including Las Litografías Santiagueras del Departamento Oriental de la Isla de Cuba from 2015, La Virgen de la Caridad del Pobre en el Alma del Pueblo Cubano from 2014, Cuba in Old Maps, 1999, and Mial's Colonial Cuba, 1994. He has also published articles and journals such as Cuban Studies, Espacio Laical, Herencia del Caribe, and Revista de la Biblioteca Nacional José Martín. Our second presenter, Dr. E. Carmen Ramos, is with the Smithsonian American Art Museum. She is curator for Latino art at the museum. In 2014, she organized Our Americas, the Latino Presence in American Art, a major traveling exhibition that presents selections from the museum's pioneering collection of Latino art. Dr. Ramos has written several exhibition catalogs and has also published in American Art, African Arts, and the New West Indian Guide. And our third presenter, Dr. Allison Fromhar, is Associate Professor in the Department of Art and Design at St. Xavier University in Chicago. Dr. Fromhar teaches courses in modern and contemporary Latin American and women's art and film studies. She has published numerous articles on Cuban visual culture and film and is currently working on a book manuscript examining the intersection of race and gender in Cuban national identity. Please join me in welcoming our first panelist, Emilio Cueto. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks especially to FIU for inviting me to share with you the results of many years of collecting and thinking about Cuban colonial prints. And the title of my, since this was about identity, I titled my, uh, my talk, Constructing Our National Identity Through 15 Projects. <coughs> I'm going to talk about 15 major projects which shaped the way we looked at, it, at ourselves and the way people look at us. During the 120 years that elapsed between the 1760s and the 1880s, 15 graphic projects were initiated at various times by various people and in various places for the purpose of describing our identity as a nation. By the 1880s, these Cuban prints had formed a large a valuable corpus of images allowing people all over the world to get to know us. We will then, I hope this is the way to do it. Now, how do you move? The arrow on the right. Sorry? Arrow on the right. Yeah, I did the arrow and it didn't happen. Towards there? Towards there? Oh, okay. So I divided the, the um, 
I'm going to talk about the major period, the golden age of Cuban prints, which is between 1760s and the 1880s. So, so you can see a contrast between 1492 and 1762, which is 270 years, I've only uncovered eight images of Cuba, not much. And then between the 1760s and 1860s, which is 120 years, I'm going to describe 15 projects with 349 images. So as you can see, it's a big jump from the earlier part to what happened next. At the beginning, we got, which I believe is, The other arrow. The other arrow goes left. I'm doing the right arrow, hopefully. For some reason. Uh, let's do left and see what happens. It's left. Anyway, um, it's fine. The first images I know of Cuba appeared in 1595 in a compilation printed in Frankfurt in, in that year, and it described two attacks on the French on Havana. As you can see, they're all fantastic, they're not realistic. And that's the first image they got, the world got to know about Cuba, about French sacking Havana in this year. <coughs> then, something important happened in Cuba in 1628. The Silver Fleet, which was um, a major um, combination of ships that would come once a year from the New World Spain bringing the treasures of Peru and Philippines and they would all converge in Havana and from there they would be convoyed and protected by the Spanish fleet so that um, so that they would be safe in the trip. Well they weren't safe on 1628 because Admiral Pihain from Holland cut the ship off Matanzas and of course this was a great event, a great defeat for Spain, a great victory for Holland and that um, took a life of its own in the world of printing. Several prints were made. There are two major, uh, two major uh, images. The first one here, um, done in 1628, was copied several times, and then a new one in 1630. Two images, again, fantastic. There's a port, there are ships, and of course there's no attempt to be realistic at the time, but that's how the world got to know Cuba, through the ships attack. Then we get to the classic view, which reigned for, for several years, between 1609, which is the first one I found, to about 1680s. And this is classic view, where you have, it, it first appeared in, I don't know where you have the little, maybe this is the one. Anyway, it, I'll show you, I don't know how to use this. It first appeared in the borders of several Dutch maps. And this is a map of America by Hondius of 1634 and in, in the various Dutch maps of the early 17th century views of Havana, all of them invented, taken by descriptions of travelers because Spain obviously did nothing to describe Havana unfortunately, um, they would take the cue. And then you can see on the right side a, a blow up of that image that appeared in 1671. And you can see the Mororo, which looks more than the Kremlin, uh, an Italian <laughs> fortress. And of course, um, Gothic, Gothic spires in Havana, because they didn't know how, to, how it looked. They knew there was a, a Moro castle on the left, and a city on the right, and a chain that would, uh, would impede the entrance to Havana. So they, they put all that information taken from books and descriptions of travelers, but of course it was a fantastic view. But of course, things don't, don't, you know, things happen and change. And then we have this very strange view, the first oil of Havana I've ever found. It's a, it appeared in a, uh, in a Belgian painting that is today Munich's Alte Pinacothek. And it's a, it's a little image that appeared on the side of this um, series of continents. This, is, um, this Belgian artist did four continents when he went to the American continent, he put little cities around the, or not little cities, he put cities in little pictures around the border. And the Cuba one is this one. And um, so I blow it up there on the right side. Uh, that's a way 
the floor was painted. Thank God no one, it wasn't reproduced, because no one would have ever come to visit us if we looked like that. <laughs> uh, this one, of course, being an oil, not a print, had no circulation and no impact whatsoever in the future. Maybe a plant is preventing this thing. <laughs> well, I... Anyway, um, this is a very strange looking picture. Again, you know, they knew that the city had, there was a bay, okay. Then we get to the next event that caught the imagination of, of the artists. In 1519, the then mayor of Santiago de Cuba, Hernán Cortés, decided that he had other things in mind rather than rule the little Santiago, and went on to conquer Mexico. Of course, being, that being a major event in the history of the continent, that event caught the attention of, uh, of the artists. And we have these views, again, fantastic. None of these views are real. Depicting the departure of Cortés from Santiago Bay in 1519. The one comes from the 1691 edition of Solis' work printed in Paris. They entrusted it to a Belgian artist then living there, Dutch artist, sorry. And the next one is the same. That image um, had about 10 uh, copies made in various editions of the Solis work. As you can see, nothing major. And then the next one, you have the next. And then this is the Spanish, this is the only Spanish view of Cuba in 270 years. It's a little vignette on the front piece of a book of 1724, 1726. Again, you have Cortes. I mean, there's a picture of Velázquez, who, who was a colonizer of Cuba, and you have uh, the uh, departure of the three ships of Cortés towards Mexico, um, and the little guy saying hello, which is bigger than the three ships. So um, that's about it. And then, thank God, as far as, as far as this paper is concerned, the British arrived. <laughs> because the British changed everything. I was just reading yesterday a, little, a, a new book that's coming up soon by Lisandro Perez, a professor from FIU, and he pointed out that if 153 ships had arrived in Cuba a year uh, before 1762, the year the British were there, 780 ships arrived. So the arrival of the British in Cuba changed everything, but it was extremely important for the history of Cuban art. But for the first time, for the first time we had realistic images of Cuba, because the British had the, um, the wisdom of having in every uh, ship they had an artist on board, an artist who would then take pictures of what they saw and, and do maps. So the history of Cuban cartography really starts, the printed cartography starts with the British, and also the history of Cuban views. Um, and then we have the first project, um, and that was by engineer Durford. He managed to do six views of Cuba, and those are the first views that he, that we know of, of um, realistic of Cuba. This is the old square and the St. Francis Square, both still in Havana. Next. The next, 60 years later, we have the next project trying to show the world who we were, and that's from a Frenchman named Hippolyte Garnelet, who lived in Havana in the 1820s, and he took his images to be etched in Paris in Aquatint. And you have the old square, the same square we saw before, and the arms square uh, before the statue and before the template they were built. Next. Then we have the major figure in our whole history, Frederick Mial, a Frenchman, who was asked by the society, the Royal Society of Cuba, to come and live in Cuba and bring a lithographic press and start a whole album. It was the first Cuban attempt made in Cuba, the first images printed in Cuba that tried to travel throughout the island and show us who we were 
And these are two images. One is from Pinar del Rio, a coffee plantation. The other one is of Regla. Niale did two books. This is the first one. Next. And then he traveled to Matanzas, and he also traveled to Santiago, and you have the cathedral. This compilation of 53 views is the most important that had ever been done in Cuba, and the first attempt ever to paint all of Cuba and show it to both Cubans and to the world. Next. Then we have a competition. Niale brought competition to Spaniards. Uh, Fernando de la Costa and Laureano Cuevas opened the Spanish lithograph center in Havana, and he had a plan, the same plan to travel to Cuba, and he did uh, the, the whole album consists of 85 views, so again a major undertaking of depiction Cuba. Um, we have two Havana views, the theater it disappeared in the 1846 uh, hurricane, and a, uh, a, a little chapel. Next. And then they traveled to Matanzas, those are two views of Matanzas, but then the, unfortunately, the enterprise went broke, and they never finished the entire island, so we ended up with only 76 views of Cuba and a few of Matanzas. Next. Then Miale, who had remained in Cuba, went on again to a second album, the most important album of Cuban views, um, and he did 30 views. Uh, this is Havana on the left, the Captain General buildings, today is in the year. Here is Trinidad and there is Baracoa. So he travels throughout the island in 30 views. And then something terrible happened. Oh, then this is the Zapateo. And in this second album, Miale not only got to describing the island, but also the customs of Cuba. He was really our first costumbrista painter ever. And these are two images, one of the country dance in Zapateado, and the other is a view of sponge fishers in Nuevitas. But then something terrible happened. Um, a German-based company established in Havana, Bernardo Mai, decided to plagiarize the work of Miale. And it did not only once, but twice. The first time, this is the, the, the copy, but he, he copied 30, 27 images out of the 30 of Miale, and just put his name on it and sold it. Of course, Miale was quite upset when he saw that, and he sued. Um, he had not, um, he could prove that he had obtained the copyright, and therefore they settled out of court and left Cuba, a little upset, I suppose. And then, Mia, and then the, my company decided to do the second work, which is done in Berlin in color. Next. And then he plagiarized Miale. These are more known than the Miale ones because they are in color, and color happens to be very attractive. Next. And then he, the Mai invented the most uh, probably the most reproduced image of all colonial times of Cuba. You can see the contrast between the original and the right one. The original, of course, is accurate because Miale saw it in Cuba, and the Germans did it in such a way that did an unrecognizable picture. The wheels of the Kitrin are smaller. They pushed, they thought this girl here was a little uncomfortable, so they pushed her to the back, creating an, an impossible posture because the Kitrin could not hold three people. It was only for two people, and a little strap on 